Welcome back. Our next presenters are Dr. Martin Scanlon and Mr. Michael Stringer, who will tell you all you need to know about the science behind bubbles and foam. And uh, bubbles and foam from a many different perspectives. And as you can see the uh, props here, uh, you are probably guessing what they are going to see. Uh, show you, so it is very exciting uh, propose, uh, presentation. Dr. Scanlon is a professor of food technology in the Department of Food Science, and he is currently acting head of the Department of the uh, Department of Food Science in the Faculty of Agriculture and Food Sciences. For his research, he takes established scientific concepts and uses them to understand how changes happen to the properties of foods as they are processed. His first uh, introduction to bubble-filled beverages may have been while growing up in his parents' pub in Northern Ireland, but he has since become an expert in the science and technology behind the bubbles and foam in various biological materials. He has an extensive understanding of bubble nucleation and growth. Dr. Scanlon received his PhD from University of Leeds before coming to Canada. He joined the faculty here in 1991 and is author or co-author of more than 160 publications, including two patents and 83 uh, journal articles. His colleague, Mr. Stringer, also had an early and informal education in foam and bubbles in the bathtub as a kid, <laughs> but later developed his expertise at the Atlantic Tourism and Hospitality Institute and Culinary Institute of Canada at Holland College in Charlottetown, Prince Edward Island. There he examined all things bubbles as they relate to cooking, breads, sausages, and beverages. And he has expanded that knowledge as a technician in the University of Manitoba's Food Science Department. We are pleased to have both of them here today. Please welcome Dr. Scanlon and Mr. Stringer. Welcome. Good morning, everyone. Um, bubbles, zubbles, surface tension, and soufflés. Um, I'm sure you've all heard of bubbles and soufflés. Some of you have probably heard of surface tension, but what the heck are zubbles? <laughs> and according to the website, and they're just very new out on the market, they don't even have them in Toad Hall, zubbles are the world's first colored bubbles. And as you can see, they've been trying to do this for about eight years now, trying to get the technology right, probably so that it doesn't blind, uh, blind you as the <laughs> bubbles burst, to get these colored bubbles. So if you're interested, um, go to zubbles.com. Uh, two four ounce bottles of, what is it, Presto Pink and Blazing Blue will only cost you $14.95 US. <laughs> so that's all I'm going to talk, or, or we're going to talk about zubbles. Uh, we're now going to move on to bubbles, which is the main part of the talk, where I think most people can appreciate that bubbles are an integral part of many foods. And certainly, we, when we talk about carbonated beverages, they're a very important part in terms of the mouthfeel and the flavor of the products. But you can also see lots of bubbles in natural cellular products. So with a potato, it might be only about 0.25% by volume, whereas with an apple, it's up to about 25% by volume. You know, Dr. Scan, we actually use foams and sauces, uh, foams and bubbles in the kitchen quite a bit too. We'll often use a little device like this with nitrous oxide. Makes sauces lighter, lighter texture, lighter flavor. So it's just a different take on uh, on old tech, uh, on old uh, old tastes. Okay, yeah. So that slightly connects with G Dr. Anderson's talk because uh, it's nitrous oxide as opposed to nitric oxide. Um, we've got many processed food products. A lot of dairy desserts have a significant amount of air incorporated into them. And if you've got a um, aerated candy in front of you, feel free to uh, indulge in it. Some of um, <laughs> We, Nestle have not been sponsoring this um, venture. And a lot of the work that we've been doing scientifically has been looking at aeration technologies in bread and in cakes. And this strange item towards the right is actually a crumpet, um, which is a, a famous British delicacy. Now, 
I hope you'll appreciate, because the, there's a pervasive amount of products with bubbles in them throughout the food industry, that there's actually been quite a few studies looking at the science and technology of how to get bubbles into food products and how to get them to give the right kind of properties that were expected. And so in the last 12 years, there's been two books out, Bubbles in Food and Bubbles in Food 2, Novelty, Health, and Luxury. <laughs> and Grant Campbell, um, who has spearheaded a lot of this work, he says that the reason that this is important is because aerated foods represent the best that the domestic chefs, such as Michael, can aspire to, or indeed the industrial food technologists can aspire to, in terms of creating a sense of novelty and luxury. But as you'll appreciate from the ephemeral nature of the zubbles, these bubbles, it's very hard to actually control them in the food. And so there's actually quite a need to actually establish good science in order to understand that. And that's true with, with chefs, eh? Well, we should introduce another fellow, Peter Barham. He's a polymer science, or a physicist from Bristol, England. He's justified the studies of foods and foams because the foods they enhance or produce actually can enrich our lives. Yeah, and this guy, Peter Barham, he's, done, he's worked for about the last 20 years with Hessen Blumenthal, who's probably one of the most famous celebrity chefs in the world, trying to get the science of his cooking in his restaurant right. Um, so, so I hope then you can see that there is a need for understanding the science and technology. And what we want to do today is just provide a snapshot of some of that science. And hopefully Mike's going to demonstrate it with a few interesting examples. I'll start off with the more scientific part first and do a few definitions. One thing that's very important is to represent that we, uh, recognize that we've got a two-phase system here. So we've got bubbles in a matrix of liquid. And one extremely important defining parameter is the volume fraction of the gas. And the volume fraction of gas is important for a number of reasons. If you look at this top equation here, this parameter phi, the volume fraction of bubbles, that affects the viscosity. So if we've got more bubbles, it's going to be harder to pump. So therefore, our machinery has to work harder. There's also issues associated with packaging. If your machine is producing 40 tons an hour of cookies, and today it suddenly is configured to, because of the leavening agent going off in the oven too much, you've now got 17.3 cookies filling the space of where you had 17 yesterday, you've got a massive problem in terms of controlling that packaging operation. It's also important in consumer appreciation of the product. Uh, we'll talk a bit more about how bubbles are very important for the mouthfeel of commodities. But if you look at those two pieces of ice cream at the bottom there, which one are you going to pick? <laughs> well, which one? Uh, the one on the left. But you can see that they've both got the same amount of product in terms of a bit. Yet there is this, certainly a consumer satisfaction with, I want the one on the left because it's got a bigger volume. So it's giveaway time, and I got my first uh, aerated candy to throw out here. Anyone know who devised that equation at the top which says that the viscosity changes with the no, uh, with the volume fraction of hard inclusions or bubbles that we include in it. Mr. 1904, Annus Mirabilis for this guy, German, or German born. Einstein. Who's a, who said Einstein? Einstein. Oh. 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 Sorry. Here, I'll try again. Yeah, all right, next back. <laughs> yeah, it is Einstein. So this was one of his famous papers um, looking at um, how, this, how this relationship was formed. So back to a bit more science. Um, so one thing to recognize that you can have different gases in these bubbles. It's got a certain pressure and density. A very important parameter is the bubble size distribution. So this 2R1 defining the diameter. We've also got different properties associated with the matrix. So you can think of the liquid, the viscosity of something like dough compared with the viscosity of something like uh, soda. 
So very different properties depending on, uh, very different bubble entrainment properties depending on the uh, viscosity of the matrix. And finally, the fourth part in our talk, or fourth part in our title, surface tension and solubility. So it's important to recognize that because we've got a two-phase system, we now create an interface. And molecules can cross across that interface and we've also got this phenomenon known as surface tension, which is uh, going to be an important part of the talk today. So most of you might not be familiar with surface tension, so I'm going to start picking on people. Have we, have we any people from Glenlawn here? If you're from Glenlawn, stick your hand up, please. Stick your hand up, all the way up. <laughs> any people from Pinoa? Keep them up, keep them up. One from Pinema? Oh, well, that, that, all right. Well, I'll just pick on the people from Glenlawn then. <laughs> um, what do you notice about the people from Glenlawn? They're all together. They're all together. So what you notice is that there's a tension for these people from Glenlawn interacting with the outside world that they prefer to have an enthalpic contribution by sticking with each other. And it's the exact same thing with molecules. When you have molecules at the surface that say something like um, water molecules that extensively hydrogen bond, it's much easier for them to hydrogen bond with each other. Whereas to configure themselves to interact with another phase, there's actually an energy penalty. And so we're going to keep coming back to this concept of surface tension. Some consequences of this two-phase system. First, as we'll see later, there's a tendency of these bubbles to cream. And if we've got a foam, the foam material will also drain down. Again, going back to Dr. Anderson's talk, if we've got gravitational forces, these are going to be acting on this foam-filled system. There is also the fact that we have interface matrix relations. And Henry's law states that the concentration of a particular gas dissolved in the liquid is proportional to the pressure of that gas in the bubble. And so if we look, going to a can of soda, so when the can of soda is put together, they'll typically put five atmospheres of gas into that headspace. And so then there'll be an equilibrium established where that CO2 is driven into the liquid matrix. And so we have this concentration of CO2 in the liquid, which is proportional to the five atmospheres in the head, head space. There's also going to be migration. I think I already mentioned that. And another equation that we want to introduce is Laplace's law. And what Laplace's law says that the pressure in this bubble is going to be slightly greater than the outside matrix. And that's proportional to the surface tension, but inversely proportional to the bubble size. So bubbles, small bubbles have higher pressures, and that's going to be driving the gas out of the bubble. Yeah, so as I just said, so there's going to be an energy penalty about trying to create new bubbles where we've got, two, that we've got an energy penalty that's proportional to the surface tension and proportional to the amount of surface area that we're trying to create in creating that bubble-filled liquid. Dr. Scanlon, yeah. it's getting a little dry. Maybe you should do another candy giveaway, perhaps? <laughs> OK. Maybe. All right. OK. That was an aerated chocolate. This one is not, the chocolate isn't aerated, but the biscuits are that's inside it. So what was the question I was going to ask, Mike? I think you want to know whose law it is. Oh, yeah, yes. yes. Who, whose law, Laplace or Henry, that states that the concentration of dissolved gas is proportional to the pressure? Oh, no, sorry. Oh. <laughs> Do we have liability insurance? Sorry. You know what, Pat? I'm just going to give them to you. No, keep it. But. You were aiming for those Glenlawn students. Right? <laughs> All right, so going back to the science then again, there's a number of ways in which, as technologists, we can get that gas in and overcome this energy penalty. So the sparging and training and supersaturated nucleation. 
I'm not going to talk about sparging much, just to say that you'll have a frit with a uniform pore size, and we have an overpressure of gas that drives the bubbles through. Second way is by entrainment. And so we've done a fair bit of work looking at dough systems where we're entraining gas into the dough. And so if you look at the top line here, where we're mixing in vacuum, there's no molecules of gas on top of the mixer. So then as the dough slops over, it can't pull these molecules of gas in. And so no matter how long we mix, the density doesn't change. You can see, though, when we're doing normal mixing, as, as you would be doing no domestically or, or mainly industrially, what you'll see is that the longer we mix, the more gas we entrain as a result of the dough slapping over pockets of gas and pulling them in and then subdividing those gas bubbles. Another way, and oh yeah, just before we move on, Here's a consequence, what you can see from this classic study done over 60 years ago, or nearly 60 years ago, yeah, no, over 60 years ago, um, where we've mixed in air and mixed in vacuum. That energy penalty associated with surface tension is so big that the yeast that we put into the dough is not able to overcome that energy barrier. And so unless we bring in those nuclei by mixing air into the, into the dough, you're not going to be able to get the yeast producing the right kind of volume or the right kind of crumb structure. So there's very significant effects of aeration in, um, in, in bread and cake making. A third way, well, a sort of subset of entraining air is to mix, but also to have a phase change. And that's what Mike's going to show you right now. We're going to do an ice cream a little bit differently than you might do it somewhere else. We're going to use liquid nitrogen, which is actually at minus 196 degrees Celsius. It's actually boiling at minus 196 degrees Celsius. So as we add it to our cream and sugar, which is just a very basic ice cream mix, it's going to be boiling, and it's going to add bubbles to the yeah. inside of this ice cream mix. So the mixer will entrain some, and then that gas, that we did, which is initially liquid, is going to vaporize, and it's going to go into those bubble nuclei that we form. And as I said uh, earlier on, maybe about 50% of the volume of ice cream is air. And so we're going to generate that air in situ by using the liquid nitrogen. And it can get a little hairy, so I've suited up properly. Oh, yeah. i got to get remember the safety. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. He, he is a messy worker in the kitchen. <laughs> now, why I've got the Guinness Book of World Records up, that same guy we were talking about earlier on, Peter Barham, he's got the Guinness World Record for the fastest making of ice cream. He does it essentially the same as what Mike's doing it. And I think he did it, he, he's done it in about 18 seconds. I think Mike's going to take significantly longer. Thanks, Dr. Scammon. <laughs> <laughs> I think we've got ice cream here. <laughs> That's for Dr. Scanlon. <laughs> but you can see it's totally crystallized, and you can tell the texture's changed. If you could eat it, which you could, but unfortunately you're all sitting up there, it would taste pretty good. All right, a third way of getting bubbles into the, um, into, and overcoming this energy barrier is with supersaturated nucleation. So if you recollect, I said that there's five atmospheres of pressure driving gas into that can of soda. Once you pull the can, uh, once you release it, we've only got one atmosphere. And so now that CO2 that was in equilibrium of five atmospheres is now out of equilibrium. And so what we have to get then is the nuclei that will actually allow that, that coat to outgas. But as I said, if you've got very small bubbles, there's a very high energy penalty because it's inversely proportional, to, or it's proportional to the bubble size. So remembering what we just said about Henry's law, we now degas, and what you can see is that it's important that we get those heteronucleants in there. 
And one of the ways that you can get heteronucleation is you can, before you open the can, you get that headspace, you mix it up, and what have you got? You've got all that gas now dispersed as bubbles. And bang, that driving force of four atmospheres of CO2 goes into those bubbles, and you know what you get? As the bubbles cream out, they entrain an awful lot of liquid with them. You can also see this with champagne, and this is very important from the visual appeal perspective of champagne. When you dry the glasses, there's little cellulose fibers left behind. Those cellulose fibers have little air holes in them, and then those air holes uh, act as the nuclei where the CO2 is fed in, and you get these bubble trains. Can I uh, interrupt you for a second, Dr. Scanlon? Yeah. There's actually another way we can do this, you know. This little Mentos candy, which I'm sure you're all familiar <laughs> with, <laughs> has thousands this of... This better go right, Mike. <laughs> thousands of little tiny nucleation sites, which Dr. Scanlon will tell you a little bit about in a second. But if we add oh, one to this, we'd probably have some sort of a massive outgassing event. But if I had three, I don't know, would it do the same thing or not? I've done this before, but I did tape the balloon. I'm just gonna hold it with my hands, so we'll see what happens here. If I can get them in. Oh, they're gonna tease me now. Oh, geez. <laughs> Now, you see what's happening? Um, th as, as Mike said, there's thousands of nucleation sites on it. So immediately, that, that energy barrier is overcome. And uh, as long as we've done the calculations right, that, <laughs> that bubble should still uh, hold. And you can also see the fact that as those bubbles outgas and they cream up, they're entraining an awful lot of liquid with them and bringing that over into, into the balloon. How many liters of gas should I have here? It should be nine grams, so nine grams divided by, uh, nine divided by, oh, I can't remember, but it, it, there should be a few <laughs> liters. There should be more liters than the, um, than, the, um, than the two liters of liquid that is there. So it's nine divided by 44 times 25, whatever that works out at. And it won't taste very good anymore, unfortunately. <laughs> yes, and that is an important aspect that we're gonna deal with later, is the um, issue of the contribution of CO2 to actually good mouthfeel. So for those of you that uh, missed it, you get these gushes of CO2 as a result of putting the Mentos in. So going back then to sparging and supersaturated nucleation. So we're combining two Dr. events. Salmon, sorry, it's getting dry again. I know we just played with the balloon, but maybe okay. we need to have a uh, trivia question perhaps. It looks like a smart Another crowd. candy giveaway. Another candy giveaway. Okay. You bump it forward one. Okay, we'll do. We'll pit the. We'll pit the Brit against the rest of everybody else here. He is British. I don't know if you've noticed or not. Okay, I'm just gonna come over here because I'm wearing glasses, but it is hard to see. Okay, if somebody. I expect a decent answer from somebody out here. Between the years 1960 and 2000, the British public deemed one of these innovations to be the greatest invention. Was it a first test tube baby? B, ultrasound scans during pregnancy, pretty important, kind of novel. Magnetic resonance imaging. Yeah, uh, Mike Mansfield got a share of the Nobel Prize for that one from the University of Nottingham. Fiber optics, double helix structure of DNA. Yeah, so Watson and Crick, joint British-American um, structure elucidation. Or F, none of the above. <laughs> okay. Why? <That's> an <laughs> Why, what's, okay. what's the answer? Guinness widget. Oh, yeah, well, that, that's definitely worth it. Yeah. Dr. Scanlon. All right. <laughs> yes, um, very well done. The Guinness widget actually was, uh, as deemed by a cross-section of the British public, the epitome of innovation. And so it's actually astounding technology because what you've got here is you've got a widget that's contained in the can. Mm -hmm. And so what you can see here is I've got lots of different Guinness innovations. So there's a, there's a pressure of nitrogen in this particular widget. And what it will do is it actually then outgasses and it will cream up through the material. And, and Mike's going to demonstrate it. But yeah. I think the only way to truly appreciate it is to actually have a... Uh, <laughs> There's that nice It has creaming. to be chilled. 
Okay. All right. Poor Dr. Scanlon a glass here. And what you can see then is the bubbles creaming up, the development of this two, two, with this quite contrasting colors. And so, as I said, the epitome of innovation to your cross-section of your British public was the ability to drink what mimics draft Guinness at home while watching Coronation Street. <laughs> So I'd pour you a little more, Dr. Scanlon, but I think oh, I Oh, thank you, it Michael. <laughs> so, so there's a number of, um, I'm going to pass out one of them. I've got a number of the technologies. This is the original patent. This one is version two, where they didn't need the stalk afterwards, because they realized that the bubbles would cream up. Then we move on to, whoa, floating widget. And you know what? Everyone's heard about the technology by now, so they actually use it in the marketing campaigns. So uh, one thing that it did for Guinness is it actually established them and blew away all the competition on off-beer sales. And so then all their competitors tried to emulate this technology. They won the Queen's Export Award, what was it, the Queen's Award for Export Achievement and um, numerous packaging innovations. A couple of things just to talk about that are important. Nitrogen is very important because nitrogen is much less soluble than CO2. And CO2 is the carbonation beverage, but we keep the nitrogen in because it's very important that we retain that head. And what's the saying? The Guinness head has to last at the bottom of the glass. And so what we'll see then, Michael, is at the end of the display, that that head will still be standing as long as it's not drunken. <laughs> All right, the head on the Guinness. It's a good introduction then to the next, or the last bit of our talk, which is to look at concentrated bubble systems. So we've got our dilute bubble system. So this is like dough, where we've entrained the air into the dough. Now the CO2 starts pumping air, uh, pumping, sorry, the yeast starts pumping CO2 into that bubble. We get a concentrated bubble system, highly, and then we start getting a form. So a foam is very different than the bubbly liquid that uh, we looked at. Right. And I don't know if you want to show this, but um, one of the things that we've got is the formation of a network. So up to now, we've been concentrating on the development of bubbles. Now you can see that these plateau borders, the liquid that is in this concentrated bubble system, it now forms a network. And there's I think some I have a way to demonstrate that. OK, yeah. <laughs> Well, the, before, before you do that, just a couple of things. This is, uh, forms are very important from a physics perspective because they're a very unique form of matter in that you've got two fluids, a gas and a liquid, yet we begin to develop solid light properties from this. And one of the defining characteristics of a solid material is the ability to resist shear stresses. So why don't you show it, Mike? With sure. He didn't drink those this morning, I'm quite sure of it. <laughs> As Dr. Scanlon was talking about, we have a liquid, obviously, in the egg whites here. Egg whites are about 90% water anyway, so we're going to say the water is our liquid. And we have another liquid, or another, prop or another element fluid. with, yeah, another fluid. Fluid-like properties is the air we, uh, we're breathing right now. So we're going to incorporate some of that air and some of the liquid of these egg whites, and we're hopefully going to get something that's... Uh, Oh, foam-like, I suppose. Yeah. So you whip quickly just to just to kind of break it up, and you can see even after a little bit of whipping, we still have something that's quite liquid, right? Although you can see there's quite a few bubbles in there. It's actually starting to change color, Dr. Scanlon. Yeah. Why is it changing color? You saw it was clear before. But why? Say again. No, it's, it's not. It's, it's a purely physical phenomenon. That's right. So remember, we're incorporating bubbles. If, if he was working a bit harder, those bubbles would actually be being, being subdivided. Come on here. And what the, what the bubbles do, if they're about um, of the order of uh, hundreds of nanometers, is that they're reflecting the light. And so one of the problems with studying bubbly materials is the opacity of them is quickly developed, and that, that prevents us interrogating them with optical methods. So, 
I could have used this, this too, but this uh, is no, it's this guy, fun, yeah. isn't it? <laughs> oh, wow, wow. <laughs> so you can see as we're getting there, it's starting to become much less liquid. <laughs> All right, maybe I should move on. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, I think we're yeah, getting pretty no, close here, Dr. Scanlon. Yeah, yeah. So you can see, after just a short uh, bit of whipping, they're actually quite solid now. So if I were a little closer to Dr. Scanlon, I might hold this over his head and show everybody that you can actually turn it upside down and the egg whites won't come out. Yeah, so we, uh, again, two fluids being transformed into a solid material. So I got another candy to give away. What is causing the solidity in the form? Oh, I actually know I'm screwing up. We got another demonstration. <laughs> yeah, Mike, what is causing the solidity in, in a form? Isn't that the question you just asked? Yeah. I wouldn't want to give the answer, would I? All right, do you have any insights from working in a restaurant then? Well, in kitchens, we use a uh, different material to do something interesting, novel. A uh, fellow in Spain, actually, at the restaurant El Bulli designed this. I don't know if anybody's heard of it. We're going to use sodium alginate. Some of you have seen some packages in front of you here. If it's not right in front of you, share with somebody and just kind of peek around if you can. I'll take you through this demo step by step. Open the package, carefully dump everything out. You don't want it to fall on the floor. You've all been so bored with the presentation so far, you've read this 500 times, I'm sure. There's another jar called water. That's been added because we're going to do something else. Take the syringe. There's no needle, no fear. Just don't poke it in your eye. <laughs> Remove the plastic syringe from the package. Take the one that says 2% sodium alginate. Open it up, take a look at it. Roll it around, don't tip it in your lap. Is that that liability insurance again? Yeah. It's viscous, but it's liquid. You can see that. Pull up about halfway into your syringe some of the sodium alginate. Okay, and it might drip, so just be careful when you're doing it. So this is the colored liquid. This Try is the colored liquid. Up. And I've actually used caramel color to color this, just for, you know, just for giggles. <laughs> Grab the one that says water, the one we've added, and just drop a few drops into the water. Doesn't matter how much you add. Take a look at it. It kind of looks like it's clumped at the bottom, right? Maybe? Yes, no? One nod. Yeah? Okay, thank you. <laughs> Shake it up. Just give it a couple good shakes. Open it up again and tell me what you see. Still liquid, right? Still looks fairly fluid. So two fluids, we're mixing them and we've still got a fluid. Right. Okay? So there's no network formation going on here. Where's my positive affirmation? Nobody put it into the other one, did they? <laughs> awesome. Okay, grab some more of the alginate if you happen to use it all the first time even though I told you not to. <laughs> Just pull up some more alginate in your syringe. Now grab the other container, the one that says 1% calcium chloride. You know the difference between sodium and calcium, right? Of course. I just dripped. Anyway, so take your calcium chloride and just put a couple drips. Make sure you don't put the tip of it actually into the calcium chloride. Just drip it in a few times. And take a look in the bottom. You'll see it's kind of maybe solidified a little bit. Okay, grab your funnel with the cheesecloth. I know it's pretty technical. Grab your bag yeah, and just so hold the, the bag. end. Yeah. Hold the end in the top of your bag like so. You can put your syringe in there if you want, doesn't matter. Dump out the calcium chloride through the cheesecloth in Hang your on, bag. Hang on, Mike, you're losing people. Have we lost a few? <laughs> yeah. Okay, so I got my bag in one hand, the calcium chloride with the little beads in the bottom in this hand. And I've just put the funnel in the top so I'd collect my mess, that's all. Everybody's with me so far? Dump it out. Take a look in your, in your cheesecloth. What do you see? Little beads, eh? Kind of neat. We do this in the kitchen, but we'll use juice maybe instead. And we call that like a juice caviar. It's got a solid exterior with a juicy interior. Sure. When you're done with it, just put the stuff back in your bag. Pat's oh. going to come around so everybody can see if they've made a mistake. <laughs> Not that I think you would. 
but just keep everything in your bag so we don't make a mess for the folks after. So we, we saw where networks were very important in the formation of a okay. foam. This is a different kind of network in that what we have is polymers, a polymer solution that's alginate. It's fluid, but when we add the ions, the calcium ions, we actually get cross-linking occurring between the different polymers. And as a result of that, we set up this network structure. So my next candy giveaway then is to say, okay, we've not added calcium ions to the whipping. What's defining the network? In, what's the defining parameter in the network for the foam, for the uh, egg whites? But why, why air bubbles, yeah? Right, why? Rem remember, whenever we've got surface tension, we've got an energy penalty. So what we do when we start shearing materials, we actually stretch those faces. And there's an energy penalty that's proportional to the amount of stretching and the surface tension that is actually resisting it. And so in a foam, you will get a yield stress and you will get a degree of elasticity, but it's very important to recognize that that elasticity is very ephemeral. It's going to ver disappear very quickly. Another thing that's important, and why, before we move on to surface tension, is that it's the more bubbles we have, the more surface we have, and therefore the, the stiffer the material. So we're going to just quickly, because I'm getting the nod from Janice here to get off, um, <laughs> we're going to move quickly through some of the um, the the the, the, the decay of these materials. Going back to Laplace's law, remember that we had a higher pressure in the smaller bubbles. What that means is that gas is going to be driven from the smaller bubbles to the larger ones. And so this is some work that we've done with meringue mixes that over the course, so these, it's a series of still pictures taken every second. And you, what you can see is that the Smaller bubbles are dying, they're having the life sucked out of them by the growth of the larger bubbles because there's a higher pressure in those smaller bubbles and the whole thing accelerates as, as they get smaller. And so one of the things that's very important then in, um, in, in this is that if we want to make good souffles, you've got to mix a lot to get small bubbles to give you better solidity and then you've got to get it into the oven faster. And so Mike's done this with two souffles here, one on the right where we, where we had good solidity, good small gas cells and good gas holding capacity and you can see that it's risen up a lot. What was it, you put equal volume of material equal in both weights. cases? Equal weight, sorry. Yeah. Okay. So, um, we were asked to talk very brief, and uh, no, it will be very briefly, um, talk about the future. So one of the things that we've been doing with a colleague of mine, Dr. John Page in the Department of Physics, is looking at using ultrasound to study the mechanics of, and the destabilization of forms. And why ultrasound is good, because you saw as we whip that egg white, we can't see through it anymore. But it's still very important that we understand what is going on, particularly in terms of coarsening of, of gas cell structure. So we plotted here attenuation against aging time for two different types of foam. And you can see that the attenuation for all the different frequencies increases as the forms age. And we can use a parameter that, uh, using, using a combination of the velocity and the frequency, which we study to look at how we reduce that data. And what you can see is that the drier form with the thinner cell walls is aging faster. And so what we're able to do with ultrasound is to actually probe events that are going on that are inaccessible by optical methods. And so we've had quite a few papers now out in both physics and food technology journals looking at how we can control, better control bubbles in food systems as a result of using ultrasonic tools. So I'll wrap up at that point because, um, so that we can get off the stage. Um, uh, just going back to the end part of our talk, uh, souffles, and I'll just make a comment that um, I'd like to especially thank Michael for all 
all the work that he's put into, both in terms of demonstration and uh, making use of his culinary expertise. Although I do want to make one comment that those are pretty sad looking souffles. <laughs> what are you talking about? I worked hard on those souffles. Yeah, I know. But <laughs> I can appreciate the one on the right, you know, it's demonstrating right. what we want, but I right. mean, they're kind of unappetizing, eh? Not appetizing. Oh, I guess I couldn't expect anything else from a Brit, right? <laughs> <laughs> is it mushy peas, the epitome of the British cuisine? Yeah, uh, uh, and is this like uh, the Swiss don't know how to play hockey, eh? <laughs> so, conclusion. Surface tension is very important. I hope we've been able to demonstrate that bubbles are an integral part of the food system that we deal with, and I hope that Mike's been able to uh, demonstrate that size does matter to a souffle. Um, I'd like to especially thank a lot of people, John Page, with whom I do all the uh, physics, or the, all the ultrasound work, Grant Campbell and Leo Pyle at the University of Manchester, who I had the privilege of organizing the Bubbles in Food Conference too, and all the workers, uh, Diver, Jeremy, Laura, uh, Anatoly, Valentin, and Hussein, who essentially have produced the scientific results that have allowed us to sort of um, be supported by these other industrial sponsors. And of course, I'd especially like to thank Enzirk, who are a co-sponsor of today's event, because it's their research funds that have helped sustain some of the science that we've been able to investigate. So thank you very much. <laughs>